John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello, gentlemen. It is another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Good to be with you. Um, we've had uh, some good shows in the past, really dissecting some of the, the smaller aircraft. Uh, we're going to go back and uh, jump back into history with Northwest 255, an MD-82 that crashed coming out of uh, Detroit. And um, this one has some unique things to it. It does definitely has lessons learned that can still be applied today. And we've seen events that are related to some of the issues that were developed by the board in this accident. But the key thing here is typically when you have catastrophic accidents like this, all the, the occupants perish, whether it's flight crew or passengers. In this one, there was a fortunate young girl, four years old, who survived this accident because she was sitting in the back of the airplane. And apparently because she was between her parents and the way her parents had sheltered her, she was able to survive this, uh, this catastrophic accident, which we'll get into in a little bit. But some of the key points that uh, we're gonna touch on, of course, are flight crew actions, operational discipline. Again, this is ago, 30 years ago or yesterday, operational discipline by either a pilot flying single pilot operation or by a crew continue to be an issue. And in this day and age of automation, we keep seeing complacency. We keep seeing distraction and missing the little things. It's not big things that are taking these airplanes out of the sky. It is a combination of little things that accumulate so that unfortunately, either bad decisions are made or bad operational inputs into the aircraft flight control systems or whatever are what takes these airplanes out of the sky. And Todd, I know that you've done dissected a lot of this. And if we really look at you know, the initiation of the sequence of events, if you will, it really starts at the gate. And in this case, this was an, an aircraft that was flown by a fairly senior pilot who'd been with that airline for about 30 years, was actually a Czech airman for uh, other aircraft in the airline. And this was a August 1987 event, which I would say is uh, before the birth date of uh, many members of our audience. But like you said, there are things here that are timeless. Uh, the kind of uh, oversights that happen were things that are still an issue today. Uh, this was an aircraft that had been scheduled to fly from Detroit to, I believe, Phoenix, and they had some last-minute changes going on. Uh, they had to change runways, and other issues were going on, maybe some confusions about how to taxi to where they had to go. And in the confusion, the taxi checklist was not executed. Now, keep in mind, this was a senior captain on board who, in the reputation that he had, some of the people interviewed said, hey, this was a very by-the-book person of someone who was always a stickler for procedures, yet in this case, a very basic procedure, going through a checklist, a taxi checklist was missed. And because of that, the uh, leading edge slats and the flaps were not set at all on this aircraft. That And that is definitely a big issue because of course, we don't need to get into the aerodynamics other than the fact that flaps and slats for slow speed operation, i.e. takeoff, uh, phase of flight, um, they are a critical flight control system. Now, the question is, and the board really didn't dissect this from a human factor standpoint, 
but how is it that the crew missed this? I know that they didn't perform the checklist. Okay, so now they've got this checklist item they, they did not perform. It's obvious that uh, they were given a, a configuration or a, a runway change <clears throat> during the course of taxi. They were anticipating taking off on one of the longer runways. The wind shifted. The, uh, the air traffic control tower manager decided to switch runways. So now they've given these guys a clearance to taxi to a center runway, 3C or 3 center um, for takeoff. That happens to be a short runway. So now while these guys are reprogramming the flight management system and doing their calculations to make sure they can take off on that runway, they're still taxiing the airplane. They miss the taxiway that was to take them to that particular runway. They have to call ATC, ask for guidance to get back to uh, where they were supposed to go. So there's a lot of little things going on in that cockpit at the time. But John, one of the things that the board pointed out after the fact, but was critical and could have taken place either before they left the gate or during this taxi, was the fact that it was common apparently practice to pull a circuit breaker, specific circuit breaker identified as P40, which on the um, cause system or the central advisory warning system panel, it disabled um, a voice that when the airplane wasn't properly configured, um, would warn the crew orally with a female voice identifying slats, slats, slats. And so a lot of pilots would pull that circuit breaker. Again, pulling the circuit breaker, what? It's a safety critical system. Why would they do that? You know, um, as you were talking, and as I looked at this documentation uh, before we came on the show, I going back in my head i can remember in the 60s 70s 80s that it wasn't uncommon for flight crew to pull circuit breakers in off the speed warning i mean I, on the bac 111 they used to pull the speed warning all the time because that little rocket ship wanted an overspeed and they flew it over on you know they would they would fly it right up to where the airplane started to shake and then slow it down a little bit I mean, right on the buffering edge. It, it was a, that airplane could could have gone supersonic very easily. Big engines, though, not good power on the engines. They're not big, uh, but a small light airplane would, went like crazy. And that was a routine one. We used to when we would do the walk arounds at night, go in there. We would often find the VMO switch pull, circuit breaker pull. So it's yeah. it, you know, in those days, pilots felt entitled. I guess my my, it is a guess on my part that uh, they could pull the circuit breakers. And then we saw some of those old gray hairs uh, on ValueJet. Uh, before the big accident with ValueJet, they would pull the ground fault circuit breakers in flight and get screwed up. We, we had a heavy landing in Tennessee someplace. I've forgotten now where. We had two airplanes quickly because they were pulling circuit breakers in flight that they shouldn't have. So and there was, there was a period of time where that was pretty common. And it was apparent based on what the board's investigation found when they were interviewing other MD-82 pilots, that apparently it was a common practice of some sort to pull that circuit breaker um, because when the airplane was being taxied or um, sitting, you know, if the airplane wasn't configured, you get that warning and it became a nuisance warning. So, of course, they disabled this, the nuisance warning. The problem is it was a critical system in this particular accident scenario because the crew had failed to run the checklist and had failed to set the flap slat handle properly to configure the wing for the takeoff phase of flight. Todd, you know, you and I were just chatting that, okay, so now there's other ways to determine whether or not that airplane would have been properly configured. I mean, yeah, running the checklist is the optimal way. And we, again, have seen accidents in the past when pilots haven't run checklist, i.e. the Gulfstream 4 at, at um, Bedford, where that flight crew failed to run a checklist and had issues. But in this case, they failed to run a checklist. But what about just a visual check? I know when you fly, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> when John flies, and of course, when I fly, I mean, when I'm ready to push the power up as the pilot, I scan the entire instrument panel. I make sure everything, I look at the flap, the flap handle, I look at the gear, make sure everything is as it should be from a visual or mental model standpoint. 
And in this case, uh, that might have been the case if they looked, they would saw something out of place. But there was also something else going on during the takeoff itself, as you were pointing out before the show, that they had uh, issues with getting the auto throttle set on the aircraft. So even if they were scanning in a normal way, they already had another abnormal thing going on in the cockpit that could have distracted them. And I remember that... right too that there was a there was a lot of delays this day, with uh, because of traffic and I thought there might have been fog. I'm going by memory now. I remember this accident. There yeah. was weather in the area, but uh... I think they, I think that they were expensive delays because of the weather in the area, and you know, it might it... even have been some local weather right on the airport. And takeoff was during a civil twilight after sunset and before a complete darkness. Yeah. So uh, now you have a, a different light environment in the cockpit, um, which, again, unless you kind of really focus on what it is you're looking at, you may not immediately pick it up in your field of vision. So there are a lot of human factor elements associated with this accident that the board really didn't develop. Um, they got to the the big stuff, of course, based on the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder. But it was obvious that as this crew had pushed the power up, were taking off, and they did have a, a clamping problem with uh, with the auto throttles. Um, right at rotation, they immediately got stick shaker, and now you're in a conundrum because you're you've rotated, you've uh, attained a, a high pitch attitude for uh, initial climb you got stick shaker going off you're low to the ground you can't push the nose over because you know you're going right back into the ground i didn't see much about whether or not they firewalled the power nor did i but uh, they did say extensively in the report that theoretically if they had not gotten to the point where they were actually at, on the verge of stall they could have had enough altitude to miss the light pole that they hit off the end of the runway. Theoretically, that might be true, but as you were saying, there's a lot going on and there's suddenly a situation that's that's dire. And they even said report, and hey, you know, the pilot might not have uh, been inclined to put it back or push the nose down because they were so low to begin with. And before we uh, go on to the other performance issues of these pilots, one thing that struck me looking at this, this was a 1987 event. And I came into the industry working for Boeing in the very early 1990s. And I know that there was an industry push at that time to, to both recognize the fact that crew behavior was an issue that led to accidents. And there was a push across the industry to have crew resource management as a standard sort of philosophy of how do you train crews to work with one another, to have specific roles going back and forth during the course of their, their flight day. And to have it so that no matter how low on the uh, seniority or experience pole you are, that you are empowered to speak up if you see something going wrong. I didn't see a whole lot of human factors, human performance analysis of this particular crew. But given what you know about how the industry has progressed in the last 37 years, what struck you as far as you know, crew resource management issues or behaviors that are normal today that were not evident in this report? Well, you know, I, I remember uh, this 1978, 79, United Airlines crash that started the focus on crew resource management. But it never really got traction until 85, 86, maybe even 87. In 88, CRM was just coming onto its own because I was the mechanic rep on a number of committees and I had to sit and listen to CRM issues and I kept saying to myself how much we could profit in maintenance by having a similar program. And it took me three years before I got any traction from the industry to start the human factors programs uh, in maintenance that I did. So it was, uh, it was all in transit, I guess is what I'm trying to say, during these late 80s and the beginning of the 90s. But for the pilots, the second half of the 80s is when they started to get traction with CRM. You and know, uh, and when the you flight look, data recorder on this planet, airplane, another issue, because we just talked about the recorders. But this was one of the accidents that, that uh, was used by the NTSB and others to push for a better recorder 
on these airplanes. This was an early DC-9. At best, it had 11 parameters. At best. And when you look at the, the CVR, it's a very short CVR. Um, there, there wasn't a lot of effective communication. And it, it's obvious that you know, one guy wasn't doing the quote flying and the other guy was running checklist and doing the monitoring. They got, both pilots were engaged in looking at a similar, if not the same item. And of course that takes away the big picture focus that again, with training or the concepts that we try to train and employ today, would that have um, at least fostered better communication or a reassurance that, hey, <laughs> checklist complete. I never heard checklist complete. Why didn't I hear checklist complete? Because you didn't complete the checklist and things like that. So it's the little things, it's those communication things um, that gets back to the emphasis of train the way you fly and fly the way you train. And if you are trained and you really are plugged in in training, you're going to uh, operate that aircraft in the same manner once you're out on the line. And one of the you know, sensibilities they, that didn't exist in this report, and we pointed out earlier before the show, there was discussion about crew performance in a theoretical way. They had some experts come in and talk about it, but there wasn't anything in the report that talked about the specific dynamics of the crew in this event. And certainly because of the way the industry has changed, that would be a, a normal sort of thing in a major airline accident. That's something about how was a crew performing? How were they resting 72 hours before? What was going on that could have affected their ability to communicate with one another? Yeah. That's not the best report. Yeah, and I was I was disappointed because you know a lot of the people that were there that worked on this on this particular accident, you and I uh, know them very well, John. And yeah, they went to the obvious cause. They did spend an inordinate amount of time discussing the circuit breakers and and you know what other pilots had said about pulling that circuit breaker. That's why they never heard the can take off configuration warning on the CVR and, and things like that. That's great, but it's not reflected properly in the probable cause because they do talk about it. They do talk about the fact that the crew didn't get the take off configuration warning, but they make a, a, a final statement that says they don't know why electrical power <laughs> wasn't getting to the central advisory warning system where that takeoff configuration warning resides, why it wasn't getting power. They spent 10 pages talking about circuit breakers. I think it's a reasonable conclusion that it was most likely the circuit breaker and not sort of some, you know, some sort of power anomaly, shorted wire, broken wire, you know, faulty system. It was a practice. And, you know, I didn't see any recommendations and correct me if I'm wrong, Todd, but did you see any recommendations in the back about that circuit breaker and what flight crews were doing? I did not. And I'm taking I, a quick look at I it. I did not now. either. Nothing jumps out at me. Yeah. So, okay. If you know it's a practice, even if you don't name it in the probable cause, but you've been told this is what's going on out there. I mean, the mission of the board is to not only look for the facts, conditions, and circumstances that are directly related and causal to the accident, but we always look at peripheral issues. And I think that's a pretty poignant peripheral issue that should have been addressed in some way, shape or form. And, and you know, this particular accident does have bleed over into the business aviation world and into single pilot operations, which there are a lot of now because we have so many high performance single engine turboprops and of course, um, single pilot operated jets. So operational discipline is key and being methodical is key and running checklists are key. And so there are a lot of lessons that even though this was a crew accident and it happened in 1987, these lessons can be brought forward and utilized today in, in the arena, not only of, of aviation, but space. Because we saw when Virgin Galactic several years ago um, poor crew communication. You had two pilots supposedly that were supposed to act as a crew, but they were doing independent things and it resulted in disaster. So, I mean, there are a lot of lessons from these accidents that apply today. We haven't really fixed the problem. We've mitigated some of those risks, but have we really fixed the problem? Well, until we fix the human, we're not going to fix the problem. 
Well, speaking you know, of humans who need fixing, I was literally flying yesterday, and I was flying a Cessna 172 G1000 aircraft, and it has a level of sophistication way uh, higher than what I flew uh, first in the 1970s and 80s. And dealing with a checklist is so important. I've actually expanded on the standard checklist to make sure that the specific things that I'm doing are done when they should. And I don't get caught behind the airplane by, whoops, I forgot to turn on you know, this system or that system. And uh, I find that uh, you know, trying to go back to the old way of doing things, trusting my memory, it's just not going to cut it anymore. And, and Greg, I recently had a conversation, I mean, real recently, had a conversation with, with a couple of flight instructors talking about the younger people we have coming in today and their discipline with, with the procedures and the checklist. And, uh, and they're telling me they're having big problems with those people, with the younger people today. They just want to use memory items. They don't want to use the paper. Yeah. Uh, you know, that doesn't bode well for commercial operations in the future. You know, and the other thing is, is that once you get very proficient at punching numbers and buttons, when you're, you know, working the automation in the aircraft, whether it's programming, flight management systems and things like that. I mean, I see my son and how fast he types on his phone and how fast he scrolls through things and gets through things and, you know, opens and closes program, does all that kind of stuff. You know, that kind of proficiency is great to an extent, but it can also lead to missing things or going going so fast that you haven't really confirmed what it was that you just did before you hit that execute button. And next thing you know, the airplane's doing something that you don't anticipate or hadn't planned on. And it's because you either forgot a waypoint or, you know, you scrolled through it fast and hit execute before you really confirmed and, and really processed all those things that you just programmed into the box. I've done that more than once recently. Yeah. And it's in, you know, fortunately, um, and in some circumstances, it's okay. Okay. I, I, I find the, uh, the errors that I've made and I can correct them and no harm, no foul, but a dark and stormy night with a sick airplane, you can't afford to have that kind of mistake. And that, that's the whole crux of most of these accidents is that they've been taking shortcuts. They don't have the discipline to go step by step by step and then add something unusual to the mix. And then it's going to happen in bad weather fate says that it's always going to happen in bad weather or at night and now you've got the, the a fatal mixture yeah and we see it over and over and over well the big thing with uh with this particular accident <clears throat> of course was the fact that it, you know it was tragic and it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't the last accident where the crew missed something um, you know, we look at Delta Dallas too, a 727 that was not configured properly after the crew had been sitting on a taxiway waiting for a thunderstorm to move through. Um, they were in a daisy chain. They had shut down the airplane. And then when they restarted and were moving in the daisy chain, they didn't really go through the checklist to reconfigure the airplane for takeoff. And unfortunately, they crashed off the end of the runway. As we talked about with, uh, with um, Bedford, and uh, the Gulfstream 4, those guys didn't do a checklist. They didn't do a flight control check. And they still had the gust locks engaged. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things. It's not the big things. It's the mental things, you know, being conducted by the human. And now people are going to go, well, automation would prevent that. No, it won't. <laughs> because these guys all have automation in their airplanes and it still didn't protect them. Um, and then if you think AI is going to do that, no way, shape, or form. Because again, if you have an electrical hiccup in the airplane, all of a sudden now, the system doesn't know what to do, period, because it's not functioning. So, I mean, there, there are pros and cons. It's the fact that, you know, operational discipline by the human is, is you know, going to be the thing that saves an airplane. We've seen it over and over and over again. Um, human ingenuity, um, the human is the fastest machine in the front end of the airplane. It's much faster than a, than a computer. And if you look at the miracle on the Hudson and you think about, okay, if those two pilots weren't there, what would a machine do? What would AI have done? It would have tried to go back to a piece of pavement. 
Whereas, you know, Sullenberger is seat of the pants flying, feeling what the performance is and says, I can't make it back anywhere. I'm putting the airplane down in the water and commits to doing that and was successful. So the human element is a, is a, a critical piece of aviation safety that we, we can't forget, but we also have to ensure that the human has the highest levels of operational discipline, especially in a, you know when operating a safety critical system. You know, and Sully, I, I recently spent some time looking through the, the flight track of, of Sully's airplane again, and the altitudes, and just putting, trying to put myself in his shoes. You know, he made that call early, and it was the right call. I, I, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the numbers, but I believe that he went over the, over the bridge at less than 900 feet. The George Washington 800. Bridge. Yeah. George Washington Bridge. The bridge is 857 feet. So he barely cleared the, the bridge. And then he had time to, to stabilize his essentially landing on the Hudson. So, I mean, he had a lot going for him. He had the time and he had uh, the mental capability to understand the mess that he was in and focused on dealing with it. And we see that missing in so many accidents. And for so those of you who are familiar with New York geography, the George Washington Bridge is above 100, and, I think 170th Street, and he landed somewhere around Midtown, like like 30th Street. And again, if you know that area, you have Manhattan to the east, which is essentially very heavily built up urban area. You have Fort Lee, New Jersey, and the Palisades to the west, which is either uh, Highlands or other built up uh, uh, urban areas. So uh, he didn't have a whole lot of choice. There's no way he could have made it back either to LaGuardia or over to Teterboro. Oh, no, he had good decision-making there, but we see that missing so often. I mean, we had uh, USAF Flight 5050 in LaGuardia. These poor guys sat in that airplane for hours waiting to get out of LaGuardia bad weather, for hours. They left the airplane, went inside the terminal, came back, I forget how long, I, it's in the report, but came back to their airplane. They never did a check. In their absence, somehow the, the trim system got moved. We speculated that somebody put their foot up on the pedestal and, and inadvertently hit it, whatever the reason. It got moved, but they never redid a checklist and took off with the rudder of fully trimmed in the, in the one direction. So they got a surprise as soon as they got enough airspeed for the rudder to become effective. Uh, the airplane was uncontrollable. Unfortunately, it was already close to. to uh, um, be one that they couldn't think through it quick enough to avoid the takeoff. And and we've talked with uh, about other accidents um, and passenger safety on recent shows. In this particular instance, after the airplane, the left wing hit the light pole, of course, the airplane rolled left to an inverted position, struck the ground, hit a bridge embutment and came apart. But the main fuselage tube was upside down. And while people did survive the initial impact, they died um, either from injuries or post-crash fire, things like that. And we, we've tried to stress why it's so important, one, that you got your seatbelt on, but two, that you understand your position in space in that aircraft in relation to um, emergency exits. And three, if the airplane is inverted, you no longer are able to follow any of the floor lighting that may light up because it's now on the ceiling. Two, you're going to have stuff that, you know, was on the ceiling down on the floor, i.e. the uh, overhead luggage bins that may have opened and there's debris and stuff in the way. So you're going to have to navigate your way through that. And again, it is, it is critical that if there was a post-crash fire, you're not standing up. You're going to be crawling. You're going to be low. And in a dark environment, it's going to be a real challenge. That's why you mentally should just, you know, run through your mind. You know, I mean, yeah, nobody wants to think about that when they're sitting on an airplane that, oh, my God, if something happens. I mean, you just run a quick checklist in your mind. I got five seats ahead of me and eight seats behind me to the exits, you know, and, and that kind of thing. I mean, it, it doesn't take a lot of rocket science, but it does at least give you some preparation that if, in fact, something does happen, you're not fumbling around or trying to figure it out. Plus, the bigger thing is just remember, 
the seatbelt on the airplane does not operate the same way as the seatbelt in your car. And when you're in a very high stress, high anxiety situation, panic mode, you revert to what you know best. And if you start trying to push the button on an airplane seatbelt, you're going to be stuck in that seat because that's not the way it works. And we've seen accidents in the past where an Air Canada comes to mind, the, um, the aft lab fire that, uh, that took place on a DC-9 with the emergency landing. Um, there were a number of people that uh, succumbed to the post-crash fire, never got out of their seat because as passengers were deplaning, they saw these people um, in the seats trying to push the button on the seatbelt instead of pull the flap. That's and how we, your brain works, and you have to be prepared. Greg, on, on the subject of uh, events inside the cabin, I have that on our radar uh, to do a number of, of uh, accidents involving just that. And uh, I also have on our radar uh, stabilized approach for general aviation airplanes, yep. which is not talked about anywhere. And it's so important. Yep. And, and again, here we go with our motor skills because we don't teach general aviation pilots from the beginning about stabilized approach. We wait until they already developed their bad habits and then we try to change them. Yeah. So it's... Yep. Uh, and it'll be interesting because since Todd's doing a lot of flying, it'll be interesting to see. We're going to use him as as the guinea pig to find well, out. I was how fortunate well because I had he a, is. I was fortunate because I had a thirty plus year gap between when I was last flying when I started flying again. So many of the bad habits I had, I had already forgot. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I'm sure that's your and story. I, and I've seen your approach and it's far from stable. <laughs> yeah and oh by the way you're far from stable in a lot of different ways <laughs> well oh i love it i'm not in the barrel of this, the show yeah you, you two guys ganging up on me yeah. yeah just wait john your time is coming again trust me yeah, i know i know so with that my friends i will leave todd with our second to the last word well, uh, my second and last word is basically what we've been talking about. Here is a 36-plus-year-old event that still has issues that are relevant today. And something as basic as a checklist is basic for a reason. If you're in a situation where you're in a rush, don't care what you're flying, if you're flying a Cessna like me or the largest, most complex airplane, if you think that, oh, the situation is such, i got to rush through this, especially on the ground, slow down, take care of it, then start flying it again. And with that being said, John, I will leave you with our last words. No, if, as always, if you're going flying, do a good session of pre-planning. Make sure that you do it before you go to the airport. Do it again at the airport. Don't forget the weather where you are, the weather where you're going, and everything in between, because we still see too many of those kinds of events occurring. And then after you get in the airplane, do a, a good, uh, to the airplane, and do a good pre-flight. When you get in the airplane, do a good check, have a good checklist. I just, I've recently bought, I think five checklists for various airplanes. And I'll tell you what, no, I think they could do better. I think they could do better on the checklist. I'm, I'm a believer in having more items on the checklist and less, less. And if you don't want to do them, you can eliminate some of them if they make sense to eliminate them. But they should be there to give you, to tickle your mind a little bit, to remind you to take a look at some of this stuff. And, you know, I I, uh, I recently talked to somebody who hasn't flown in a little while, but he still had his own developed checklist that was much more extensive than any of the ones I saw commercially available. So, you know, it's your, your butts in the airplane. Make sure the airplane's in good shape. And after you get off the ground, put that head on a swivel because we're still having a lot of problems with a lot of new people flying, in very busy airports. And like I said, you don't want to be around Todd when he's flying because he's anything but stable. And he has a lot of friends <laughs> in the same position. And please, please fly safely. Uh -huh.
Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.